non littératif comparé à l'UNC. Mais ma petite créole ici, c'est un peu pour les écrire. La raison qui fait m'intéresser non étudier créole, c'est parce que ma petite vie texte qui non littératif caraïbe, là, en créole, est spécialement Haïti. Ma petite professeur et moi, Jacques-Pierre, merci, parce que vous avez organisé la célébration, ça. Et parce que les coins n'ont réellement assez pour nous arriver entre lui, Isabelle et Ayana, qui sont deux étudiants dans Duc, qui ont présenté le travail pour nous dans quelques moments. Isabelle Pavé a fait un doctorat dans le domaine des languages, ici, dans Duc. La présentation de l'IA, c'est sur un livre qui relève Agassia Chouel Sémi. Il travaille dans la classe créole intermédiaire. Uh, Ayana lui-même a fait un doctorat dans l'histoire et présentation de l'IA sur une émission radio dans New York uh, dans les années 80 uh, qui relève les Haïtiens. Je uh, dit tout le monde merci. Uh, tout le monde qui vient célébrer Junan ça avec nous, je vous remercie. Et j'espère que nous passer un bon temps ensemble et puis nous continuer à faire des traditions en Nandouk. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Chloe. I am a doctoral student in comparative literature at UNC. Uh, I am currently studying Creole here at Duke to support my research in Haitian literature. Um, I would like to thank my professor, Jacques Pierre, for organizing this celebration. Um, Professor Pierre has also given me the privilege of introducing Isabel and Diana, uh, who will be presenting their work for us in a few moments. Um, Isabel Bradley is in the Romance Languages Department here at Duke, where she works on uh, philosophy, religion, and memory in the Francophone Caribbean. Ayana, I'm sorry, she will be presenting on Emily Celestine Maggie's novel Agassia Chouan Cindy. And Ayana Legos is in the history department here at Duke, uh, where she works on radio, the Haitian diaspora, and social movements. She will be presenting on a radio broadcast that played in the 1980s in New York called Les Haitiens. Finally, I would like to thank everyone for coming to celebrate International Creole Day with us. I hope you enjoy yourselves, and I hope to see you again next year. Thank you. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Moi, Elisabeth, 
Oui, tu as déjà dit que je suis en doctorat dans le département de la médecine, en la petite de la région de Caraïbe, avec la littérature et la Caraïbe. Et puis, je suis en train de travailler sur Haïti. Aujourd'hui, nous avons une présentation qui est en train de causer avec Agassia Chouazimi. Je parle sur un roman qui est en train de créole intermédiaire. Au terme de ça, il est Emmy, pardon, Emmy c'est le seul Emmy. C'est un écrivain haïtien qui a écrit plusieurs romans en créole, tant que l'amour pas gambaillé, et puis il publie poésie, pièces et articles. Non tout grand, c'est un anagramme pour dire Maïgo, qui c'est un villa côté au dia préfet. C'est un ville qui n'est pas de ce pays. Il est tout près de la maison. Côté Marie-Gouillet. Ça, tu vois, ça, c'est Agassia ou soit Agassia Chouassimbi. Au moins, ça a décrit une tension qui existait entre religion vaudou et religion catholique en Haïti. Et puis, il a montré une tension à travers l'histoire aujourd'hui qui relève Agassia. Ça avait remarqué que une tension à existait aujourd'hui. Le livre là parlé sur un petit thème. Dans vos croyances et critiques, hiérarchie sociale en Haïti, théologie et philosophie, rapport en science sociale à croyances religieuse, mais c'est au bon manier les présenter les perspectives à Gassia et puis c'est en histoire d'homme. Et puis, histoire ça a déroulé dans la ville Marigo, côté OTA fait. Et ça, c'est en église dans la ville Japon. D'après OTA, société haïtienne, c'est une société qui gagne un peu de contradiction là-dedans. Un tambour de toute l'autre société. Mais dans le contexte, nous jouons une grosse division entre le ministère de la Féguine, dans le Vaudou, et le ministère de l'Église chrétienne, catholique. Et puis, je pense que ça a bien pu trouver avec l'éducation coloniale. Côté éducation, ça a déraciné le monde et fait ouvrir tout ça qui est la caillou, pas vrai. D'après une arrêté en Haïti, le monde qui fait dans la famille chrétienne, Considéré Vodou comme ça, ça c'est pas au Théa, comme une société nexote, sauvage, sans éducation. Une société mal affectée qui agonisait dans toute qualité de superstition. Sur page 11. Tant qu'on te dit, le personnage principal là, Rélé Agatia, si on dit qu'il est Rélé Agatia, l'histoire Agatia, c'est une histoire qui semble à l'histoire en Pimon en Haïti. Ça m'a dit, c'est une fiction liée, ou moins ça. Ah, mais l'histoire ça a représenté l'expérience en ah, hum. Non, commencement du livre là, nous respectons Agatia en vie dans la société parce qu'il est bien élevé, il est instruit et puis surtout, euh, il est en fidèle catholique. L'église chaque dimanche, il est chanté pour la messe, tout ça. Il ah, a décrit le temps qu'il vedette ou bien le modèle qu'on doit suivre parce qu'il est conformé à tout comportement qu'on considère qui est correct. Il y a un jour, surprise, il y a une cérémonie pour tout. Il y a une cérémonie pour observer, il y a une cérémonie pour ça, parce qu'il y a une curiosité intellectuelle. Mais après, l'esprit commence à bouleverser, dans le sens où il y a une question sur ce qui est lié. Il y a un passage qui montre qu'on fait ça. Un dirait que c'est bien une loi sur moi. Je me suis senti non, c'est pas moi qui t'es là. C'est pas juste. Nous avons une expérience cérémoniale, mettez l'esprit en boulatcha. Dans quel il y a un gros conflit, une expérience qui était faite dans la cérémonie, et puis volonté de gagner pour vivre dans le monde catholique. Togiram, un médi, il décrit la cérémonie avec un petit détail. Il décrit son bagui, chanté, avec le rituel dans la cérémonie. Il uh, décrit chanter pour tout le monde. Il uh, explique un peu de danse, tant que combo, jumba, guitare, rada. Il y a un peu de description pour faire les théos sentir qu'il y a assisté à la cérémonie. Si il y a des gens qui intéressent dans ça, il y a un peu de la paix qui est par exemple, il y a un peu de livre. Uh, et puis ça, c'est un tableau à Fred Michel. On a mis pied et pied et qui vient dans l'image ça. Agacia, ah, pardon, quelle citation qui montrait qui Jean a été à décrit cérémonial. 
Ah, là, la famille se yon, yon gan, il dit, il tracé yon vevé yon ve ve les gars, il fixé yon ve les mains tout près pour tout mettre un, et puis tout de suite après, roi tambour commençait à battre. On s'y yon habillé en blanc, avant mon choix même pour les amarrer tête yon, quand chantait tout. Ça, c'est si on vevé à Isan, à Isan, à Gambala, dans la société Nago qui n'a jamais. So, Agatia cherchait à comprendre quelle relation qui gagne un fidèle catholique, fidèle catholique yon, à fidèle ou deux yon. Um, dans le commencement, maman il répond à euh, pas bien aucune relation entre religion catholique et religion vaudou. Moun qui pratiquait tout deux, ça c'est les paroles de maman, il dit moun qui pratiquait tout deux, c'est moun si pesticide, qui a servi bon dieu à diable en même temps. Um, mais à Garcia, pas d'accord, il parlait sous le monde catholique qui a tombé loin. Il um, dit qu'il voyait ouais, l'église matin, ça veut dire qu'il y allait dans la cérémonie. La veille, matin, il y a l'église. Il expliquait qui j'en ai comme il fait l'Italie Saint-Yo pendant la cérémonie vaudou. Il y a un élément catholique dans la cérémonie. Agatia a fait une famille et d'elle étudié vaudou. Il y a une grande bibliothèque et puis il y a formé une espèce de société qui relève so Seba, qui veut dire Sobagi et il vaudou haïtien. Il y a fait un petit débat théologique et philosophique avec les gens qui viennent dans la société. Mais la société ne va pas réussir parce que les gens ont tombé discuter l'un avec l'autre, ça n'a pas réussi. Un thème important qui paraît dans le livre là, c'est un monde qui, qui passait un pire jugement, jugement sur ça, il pas qu'on est. Un monde à deux faces qui chargeait avec l'hypocrisie la caillou. Parce qu'il a essayé d'étudier à comprendre qui ça, qui ça a vaudouillé, à la gâtie à la famille, il a subi de grosses conséquences. Mon ami là, si je ne parlais pas avec eux, ils commençaient à éviter eux et puis ils les mettaient à l'écart. La famille Agassia a perdu prestige à la position sociale et devient dans la ville. Ça, c'est par où Agassia. Comme Haïtien natif natal, nous croyons que c'est pour nous un devoir sacré pour nous apprendre à comprendre qui ça pour nous tout bon vrai. C'est dans la bouche la vérité, toute religion est sortie. Quitte c'est polythéiste ou bien monothéiste. Moi-même, après ce livre-là, je me suis quelques questions. D'abord, il y a une question anthropologique ou bien sociologique avec religion. Est-ce qu'il est possible de garder une objectivité scientifique là où étudier le phénomène saïo sans pas rentrer là-dedans Et pour moi, moi, moi qui il n'est pas possible. Ne pas comprendre le phénomène religieux d'après une logique rationnelle ou bien scientifique. Les gens qui comprennent les bagailles, est-ce qu'ils ont un conflit entre étudier les bagailles à la connaissance ou bien la connaissance sacrée, c'est un héritage qui perdit un valet, les gens qui n'ont pas de droit à accéder, essayer d'expliquer. Par exemple, quelle est la différence qu'il y a entre les gens qui étudient les questions de Vodou, avec les gens étrangers, ou bien les gens qui ne sont pas de droit à accéder, avec les gens qui ne sont pas de Et puis, vous me posez peut-être une question qui est un exemple de Vodou à catholicisme. Que Marie a le problème en um, société postcoloniale. Une des questions qui, qui j'en ai pas reconnaître la qualité unique qui, qui est gagnée dans Vodou, ça nous paraît exotique et ça nous pas exploité. Merci. stigmatization of popular religion um, through a story about a young girl named Agassia and her spiritual, her personal spiritual exploration or coming to consciousness. Um, so it's one individual struggle with finding her truth in a world of um, sort of imported and imposed psychological and spiritual constraints, but it's also about the societal pressures um, of a neocolonial order that disallow Credit practices um, or refuse to legitimize them. So it's the the story of a non non recognition of um, vodou, which is which is a whole epistemological and metaphysical system. Um, but it's also the story of one one 
an individual and it's also a love story. émission ça parce que l'été voulait mettre l'idée dans l'émission um, haïtienne dans New York. Donc, l'été a une émission ça dans New York et puis toute émission est arrivée en Haïti. Donc, nous avons comme un radio à te porter une petite bête. Um, ça relève un bon vent. En anglais, nous dit a beetle. Il fait <laughs> Ça veut dire uh, bête ça, te fait un pile bruit dans les oreilles de monde. Comme ça, métaphore ça pour exiler yon dans la période ça, te montrer qui j'en c'est important pour faire bruit. Donc, deuxième émission, te relève le haïtien, ou Haïti 7, mais quand il Mais il a commencé pendant, ou après, il y a un gros mouvement dans l'Université de Columbia. Un pile élève, donc, un pile élève, c'est contre l'administration. Nous avons un élève noir à bataille contre l'administration parce que l'administration devait créer un gym. Mais un gym pour nous noir et puis un gym pour nous noirs. Donc, tout élève a bataille contre l'administration. Après la manifestation, Colombia a eu élève noir accès à la radio. Haïti s'est méconnu commencé à mission. Émission ça a été changée et puis il a été utilisé créole. 
So, yon moun ki te patasipe, patasipe nan uh, estasyon sa, te Michel Rof Trio. Li te ekri yon ti um, papie ki te rele lambi. Nou ka we tu patu koman komunite a isyen ap utilize plus kreo nou, nou we yon changement linguistik. Et puis un pile moon pendant l'époque ça a utilisé chanter pour parler contre la dictature du Valier. Il y a un groupe plus important pour les artistes indépendants. In English. This is like the equivalent of like a Marvin Gaye song, like what's going on. Um, it talks about the various ways in which the situation in Haiti is not good. Um, he's talking about the, po the political situation and what the future of the nation is going to look like. Emission de Haïtien, te joyon gwo wo, na batay pou protege doa refugi. Nous avons des réfugiés dans Guantanamo Bay et puis dans le Chrome 2. Un peu de monde a écrit une lettre pour la station radio pendant l'époque ça, pour demander des questions, pour demander à un peu de cousins, est-ce que vous connaissez si vous vivez dans les États-Unis Et puis, je vais jouer une autre émission rapidement. Nous avons comme un haïtien, mais nous avons parlé, parlé, parlé un peu. L'émission de l'Haïtien est campée en 2002 parce que la communauté haïtienne était divisée sur Haïti. Mais la radio continue à jouer un gros rôle dans la société haïtienne. Les pays ont une opportunité de partager l'idée, de participer dans la politique et puis by plus um, uh, respect à long créole. Merci. He's published articles on slave resistance and social control. His book, Bondsmen and Rebels, a study of master-slave relationships in, sorry, relations in Antigua, continues to be a groundbreaking study in the field of Caribbean history. He has also co-edited essays, um, one of the most well-known ones is entitled More Than Shadow, Black Women and Slavery in the Americas. Those were good ones. Well, I say it's a good one. 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 It's a good um, tonight my talk is uh, borrowed or extracted from some work that I'm doing on the, <coughs> the Seven Years' War as it, was, uh, as it was fought in the Caribbean, 1756 to 1763. Uh, and I want to dedicate this talk to two of my countrymen, Arthur Lewis, Professor Arthur Lewis, and uh, Dr. Derek Walcott, two of my countrymen who won the Nobel Prize, one for economics and the other one for uh, literature. Um, when Walcott died about two years ago, I decided that Henceforth, any talk that I gave anywhere in the world, I would dedicate to these two of my countrymen because I see myself as following in their footsteps in so far as I am able to do that. So my talk tonight has to do with what I just told you about the Seven Years' War in the Caribbean. 
uh, during that period or during that war, the Caribbean region became the setting for major naval and military operations in which Britain engaged its imperial rivals, France and Spain. By 1756, each of these maritime European powers held valuable sugar producing colonies in the Caribbean that were exposed to direct attack when war actually broke out. And maritime predation of private years was a predictable preliminary. The inhabitants of the various colonies, they did their best to prepare to defend themselves and their property, including their slaves, and to harass the seaborne commerce of the enemy by intensifying their privateering activities, straining their limited resources. Such war-related ex exertions ultimately affected the colonial slave populations whose labor could be deployed to some degree in defense preparations. However, the burden of waging war against the enemy rested overwhelmingly with the European powers and their troops, which were drawn mainly from outside the Caribbean. To assist expeditionary forces that were sent out to the Caribbean to conduct combined operations of the Army and Navy, Britain endorsed, interestingly, recruitment of slaves from its sugar colonies in the region, Barbados, that is to say, Jamaica, and the Leeward Islands. This last group of colonies, the Leeward Islands, included the four main ones of Antigua, Antique, St. Kitts, Nevis, and Montserrat. This was a bold but necessary measure when it is understood that from the earliest years of the emergence of Britain's sugar colonies in the Caribbean, proprietors of plantation and slaves and other white settlers were cautious about arming their slaves. While such attitudes would change gradually as the slave colonies grew and matured, British slave owners still preferred not to rely on armed slaves for defense. By the 1750s, however, slaves were attached to the colonial militias, not all male slaves, that is to say, who were of the correct or suitable age and able-bodied, but instead those males whom the legislatures believed could be trusted not to turn against the colonial master class. The slaves recruited by the British to assist their amphibious forces in the Caribbean in the campaigns of the Seven Years' War against France and Spain were not meant to operate as armed combat troops. But instead, they were meant to provide service mainly in the form of much needed manual labor as, and as drudges and as pioneers and rangers who would operate in dangerous and fatiguing action close to the enemy on land and even behind enemy lines. So these recruited slaves were not primarily soldiers although some of them could be exposed to the dangers that regular soldiers faced. Most of these enslaved recruits acted in support of the regular white troops whose labor was generally diverted to such duties or work during military campaigns, but who did not perform well against challenges of climate and terrain encountered in the tropics. The labor of the recruited slaves in the tropics, such as the Caribbean, was therefore seen as a valuable and practical alternative to the labor of unacclimated soldiers in the field, whose numbers tended to be quickly depleted by sickness and mortality. At the same time, though, British authorities attempted to recruit fighting men from among whites of the island colonies of the Caribbean. There were five moments or episodes of significant British action among the islands during the Seven Years' War in the Caribbean when the recruited slaves were used in such largely non-combatant labor. First, the failed attack on the French colony of Martinique in January 1759. Two, the eventual capture of Guadeloupe, another French colony to the north of Martinique, by May 1759. Three, the conquest of Martinique in early 1762 after a second attack on that colony. 
Four, the British capture of other neutral islands of the Lesser Antilles, including St. Lucia at that time. And five, the capture of Sorry, the important and thriving Spanish port city of Havana in Cuba in mid-1762. <coughs> Each of these episodes of action taken by the British forces against the enemy marked an important stage in the evolution of their campaign during the Seven Years' War in the Caribbean. In my presentation tonight, I, I, I will deal primarily with episodes one and two, which provide useful context for further consideration elsewhere of the other phases of British action during the war in the Caribbean. Here, I will explore the context in which the British recruited slaves from the colonies of Barbados and the Leeward Islands for service in Martinique and Guadeloupe in 1759. For the Leeward, Leeward Islands, located just east of the Spanish island of Puerto Rico, I will focus on Antigua, the, the principal or capital colony of that group of islands. My presentation is based on research through archival sources drawn mainly from Britain's colonial office records, the newspapers of British colonial North America, from of published official records related to the conduct of the British campaign in 1759. I focus on the origins of plans to recruit slaves from the, from the Leeward Islands, the justification also of these plans by administrative material, military and naval authorities in Britain and the colonies, the responses of the colonial slave owners, the processes of recruitment, the service performed by the enslaved recruits, and the significance of that service overall to Britain's conquest of Guadeloupe. One can begin with the large-scale cultivation of sugarcane and say that that large-scale cultivation of sugarcane using the labor of enslaved persons recruited and uprooted mainly from the Atlantic, from Atlantic West and West Central Africa was adopted in the Leeward Islands by the later years of the 17th century, much later than in the case of Barbados, which served as a model for their economic and social transformation into sugar colonies. One striking characteristic of such societies as they were quickly dominated by the influences of sugar and slavery was the rapid growth of the slave population, not by natural increase, but by regular importation of large numbers of African slaves recruited through a thriving slave trade. The total population of the Leeward Islands surged or rose from 30,588 in 1707 to 86,553 in 1756. The overwhelming majority of the population were slaves born in Africa or in some part of the Americas, that is to say, Creoles. In 1707, the racial composition of the, of the, of the islands as a whole was 23.6% white and 76.4% black. By 1756, that distribution had changed to 11.4% white and 88.6% black. Now, in, in all of these island colonies, the slave population outnumbered whites by significant margins. In Antigua, the seat of government of the group of islands, there was an estimated 31,428 slaves and 3,435 whites in 1756. It was reported that this enormous number of slaves reflected an increase through, quote, the great importation of 1755, and according to one um, witness, and the necessity the planters are under to manure, their, to manure their lands, which are greatly impoverished by long culture. At the same time, the white population of Antigua fell in 1756 from three and a half, 3,461 in 1753, when the governor had complained about how extremely weak, he says, we are in men fit to bear arms, and about the location of the islands in the neighborhood of a rival so greatly superior to us. This reference to a rival in the neighborhood so greatly superior to us was a reference to the French at Guadeloupe 
and at Martinique. Now, to control the restlessness and rebelliousness of the slave population, the colonial authorities and slave owners of the Leeward Islands placed great reliance on their slave laws, which nevertheless were not generally stringently enforced. Among the restrictions placed on slaves were those related to carrying arms or having them in their possession. But by the early 1700s, slave owners recognized that under controlled conditions and in dire emergencies, such as a threatened or actual invasion by the enemy forces, by enemy forces, they might draw on the readily available resources of their slaves and arm a selected number of such trusted or reliable men for service with the militia in defending the islands. This occurred during the wars of 1702 to 1713 and 1739 to 1748. In 1734, William Matthew, the governor of the Leeward Islands at the time, wrote a detailed report about these islands in which he stressed their military weakness. I quote, your lordships, he says, writing to the Board of Trade in London, your lordships have none of you ever seen these islands. I am going to speak to you now from what I have not learned from others, but from what I have seen and under the apprehensions of a war. Oh, the, I, the, these quotes are just beautiful. I mean, I can extract so much from them. I mean, it, it doesn't take much imagination to, to see what he's trying to do here. Um, but what he just said is a reference to a war with Spain, which he sees looming on the horizon. Matthew, the governor, re recommended that among the measures that might be adopted to defend Antigua and the other islands, he says, we certainly may arm a thousand sturdy, faithful fellows that with a little encouragement will, I know, do eminent service. He added, however, that this is a dangerous experiment for thereafter. But, he insisted, it must be done. I, I intend to write a book, by the way, I mean, that get, gets, gets back to this particular interpretation of uh, the military environment in the islands on the eve of a major war that will come in uh, <clears throat> 1739 to 1748. Um, but I'm just so taken with the, um, the language that's used by certain governors, not all of them, to describe the challenges that they face from such large slave populations in their midst. Because the idea is not to arm the slaves. And some governors are saying, you know, this is crazy. We should try to find the most faithful slaves. I don't know how they did, would do that. And um, arm those to defend these islands. Matthew's proposal may have been much more ambitious than the calculated measures taken by earlier governors in arming a selected number of slaves in a crisis. But they, like Matthew, recognized the risks they faced during the emergency and in the future. But the islands were obviously worth defending. And in preparing to do so, slave owners were willing to take what I would describe as a calculated risk of temporarily arming slaves. Such a situation arose during the Seven Years' War in the Caribbean when judiciously armed slaves and others from the Leeward Islands were recruited to assist British forces in seizing Martinique or Guadeloupe during the ambitious campaign, the amphibious campaign, I mean, of 1759. Martinique was the main French target. In May 1756, Britain declared war on France. By early September that year, the declaration of war was, procl was proclaimed by recently appointed Governor George Thomas in the Leeward Islands. Thomas promised the Secretary of State Fox to take the most proper methods in my power to prevent the subjects of France from being supplied with ammunition or stores of any kind from the islands. Acutely, he was acutely conscious of their exposure to assault by French forces and privateers from Guadeloupe and Martinique. Um, but under those circumstances, anyway, the inhabitants of the Leeward Islands prepared themselves for war. The Antigua legislature as a whole made up of the governor, his advisory council, and the elected assembly, supported arming a trusted corps of slaves 
largely because the number of white men, together with the men of the 38th Regiment posted in the island, were not a strong enough force to defend it. So in August 1756, the Antigua Assembly, consisting of several of the colony's leading owners of slaves and other valuable property, proposed that great use may be made of our trusty Negroes attending upon the several corps of militia, if tolerably well armed. And to that end, a thousand strong plain cutlasses should be ordered immediately from England. The governor's advisory council agreed, but they thought that it would be better to arm the slaves with bills upon staves, they called them, than with plain cutlasses. Why? Well, the council's explanation is not recorded, but it does seem clear that the Antigua Assembly and Council favored arming slaves with two different types of weapons, which could have different results on fighting during actual engagements. The bills upon staves or metal blades attached to sturdy posts or pieces of wood could be used perhaps like bayonets to some degree, while cutlasses encouraged the slashing, chopping, and cutting of close fighting. Now, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm reading this, uh, and it occurs to me that there's a kind of musical fluidity in that kind of construction. I did not notice this before. Thank you for listening. The Antigua Council may have thought that their preferred weapon for the slaves would cause more damage to the, the enemy. In preparation for war, the Antigua Assembly also started drafting legislation to justly compensate slave owners whose slaves were recruited to work on the construction of what they call breastworks, which are temporary fortifications around the island, or whose slaves, cattle, or horses were impressed during an alarm. By the middle of 1757, little had been done toward arming the slaves, but when news reached the Fleetwood Islands that naval and military reinforcements had recently arrived at Martinique, superior, superior to His Majesty's squadron in those seas, in those seas, the Antigua legislature became more active. The country arms in the arsenal being no more in number than sufficient for arming seamen or strangers that may serve on shore in case of necessity, and it being impossible to arm any number of slaves pursuant to a bill now before us without a new supply from England, the assembly urgently recommended ordering from England a thousand arms of the like size and more of the country arms with a little more substantial. The better locks and hammers hardened together with bayonets, exactly fixed slings, cartouche boxes, with princes and straps, with frogs suitable to the number of arms. By this time, too, the Antigua legislature prepared to issue commissions to privateers and passed legislation in 1758 to that effect. Similar, similar legislation was also passed in St. Christopher in 1757. All of the islands, all of the Leeward Islands, did the best they could with their available resources, including their slave population to prepare for the confrontation with France. By early 1759, the legislature of these increasingly anxious colonies found out that the imperial authorities, too, had designs on their slaves, intending to recruit some of them to attack Martinique. In October 1758, Secretary of State William Pitt, drafted in, in London, drafted a letter to the governors of Barbados, Charles Pinfold, and of the Leeward Islands, of, um, Thomas, about plans to attack Martinique, indicating that they should, these governors, give all the assistance and succor in your power to Major General Hobson, the Commander-in-Chief of the Land Forces, particularly in the form of a number of the natives or inhabitants of the island under your command, or under your government. Pitt instructed the governors to exert all your influence and use all legal methods in this endeavor, providing, at the same time, all sorts of aid, provisions, and refreshments that the island under your command shall afford or that you shall be able to procure from other parts. Pitt also informed Governor George Thomas of the Leeward Islands 
that Major General Peregrine Hobson had been authorized, quote, to order a detachment from the 38th Regiment of Foot, now on duty in the islands, to join him in case it shall be judged that the same can be can, consistent with the safety and defense of the said islands, be spared. These barely disguised demands from Pitt, issued as instructions, would later place heavy burdens on the Leeward Islands, but the authorities in all of the islands did their best to handle them without sacrificing their own local interest. As an amphibious or combined operation of army and naval forces. On November 12, 1758, Hobson left England for the Caribbean with two regiments and seven companies of Highlanders from Scotland under convoy of Captain Robert Hughes with eight ships of the line, massive ships, the fleet made for Barbados, where it rendezvoused with ships and men brought there from the Leeward Islands under Commodore John Moore, commander in chief of the naval station there in Antigua at English Harbor. Governors Thomas and Pinfold received their letter and instructions prepared by Pitt from Hobson when he reached Barbados on January 3, 1759. Hobson spent 10 days in Barbados, preparing his forces for the attack on nearby Martinique and waiting for some ships that had been separated from the fleet en route to the island. On January 13, 1759, Hobson's forces left Martinique and left for Martinique which is to say left Barbados for Martinique, and arrived there on January 15. While at Barbados, Hobson was able to recruit upwards of 300 Negroes for the service, quote unquote. The attack on Martinique during January 1759 did not succeed. The British forces were then moved on for an assault on Guadeloupe further north, quite close to the Leeward Islands, and arrived there on January 22nd. There may not have been sufficient time after Hobson and Hughes arrived at Barbados to recruit and transport slaves from the Leeward Islands for what turned out to be the abortive attack on Martinique. But the attempt to take Guadeloupe quickly revealed that the British forces would require valuable assistance from these islands. So on January 30th, 759, we have the Hobson writing to Pitt, sending an account of the officers and men that had been killed and wounded at Martinique and so far at Guadeloupe. Hobson also revealed that among his troops, more than 1,500 were sick, occasioned by the great heat and fatigue that the troops undergo, which is unavoidable, meaning um, the European troops that he had with him. There, which is unavoidable, there being so many outposts necessary to be maintained, and the labor of carrying the provisions up to them so great that it harasses them very much. This, it must be noted, was precisely the sort of labor that was expected of the slaves recruited so far from Barbados, and who accompanied the British forces after the debacle at Martinique earlier in January. Hobson then did, not, did have some slaves from Barbados to do some of this laborious work, but they were far from sufficient for that and the other services for repairing the fort, which must be, which they must be employed in, Hobson wrote. Nearly a month later, in February 26, 1759, Governor Thomas of the Leeward Islands informed the Antigua Legis Assembly that Hobson and Moore had sent him a joint letter uh, requesting that a number of men, white and blacks, may be raised and sent to Guadeloupe to help him out. In a separate letter of the same date, Hobson outlined proposals for raising six companies, consisting of 100 men each, to act under his orders. Quote, as the entire conquest of Guadeloupe will be attended with very advantageous consequences to His Majesty's revenue, to the British commerce, com commerce in America, and to the, friend, the future safety of the Leeward Islands, Thomas told the assembly, I most earnestly recommend to you the utmost exertion of your zeal upon this important occasion, and particularly in raising a body, and particularly 
in raising a body of able and trusty Negroes with the utmost expedition to be transported to Guadalupe and to act under Hobson's orders. Now, Thompson was, of course, fully aware of the many difficulties inherent in recruiting slaves for any service with armed forces outside the Leeward Islands. This is not recruiting slaves now to defend the islands at home. This is taking slaves out of their home islands and going elsewhere and attacking the enemy. Ooh. Um, it sounds dangerous, really. I mean, in order, therefore, to avoid difficulty and delay through unwillingness of the owners of slaves to part with their slaves, Thomas recommended that a bill should be drafted immediately to oblige all masters or owners of slaves to send in such a number as shall be agreed upon in proportion to their abilities by a certain short day and to appoint appraisers of the slaves to place a fair value on the recruited slaves. He went further. You will observe, he explained, that the slaves are to be transported, they are to be victualed and armed at the king's expense, and to be paid for in case they shall be killed or disabled. Hobson thus clearly proposed arming a number of trusted slaves to serve alongside white islanders, while others might be organized to provide much needed manpower in Guadeloupe. Now, this idea of arming slaves most probably would not have been surprising to whites of Antigua and the other islands who already had some experience of arming selected slaves to defend the islands in time of war, certainly after 1700, fully conscious of the risks involved, including the possible erosion of the social distance and relations more generally between masses and slaves, losing plantation labor, and the obvious opportunity or experience afforded slaves to handle weapons which might influence slave rebelliousness. Ultimately, slave owners must have thought that arming slaves temporarily during a war crisis was worth the risk. Governor Thomas certainly appears to have thought so. To recruit slaves for military service against a foreign colony or on foreign soil brought additional risks including flight and desertion. But the slave owners of the Leeward Islands intended to protect their interests by ensuring that they would not lose enslaved property without receiving just compensation. Slaves maimed or killed in the defense of these islands were routinely appraised and paid for by the legislature out of public funds. And slaves who performed outstandingly could be rewarded. In response to Governor Thomas's request regarding Hobson's proposals, the Antigua Assembly indicated that its members were ready to promote every measure that might be conducive to these great ends. The Assembly resolved to draft legislation to raise a corps of able, ne able Negro men, quote, not exceeding 300, as Antigua's contingent and reinforcement among the islands, which was a mere fraction of its total number of about 31,428 slaves in 1756. So if Antigua contributed 300 men, slave men, there would still be thousands left, some of whom could be armed to defend the island. So Antigua's contribution was ultimately calculatedly conservative. And the other Leeward Islands did the same. It cannot be too strongly stressed that Hobson's proposals to recruit slaves for service in Guadeloupe coincided with the coming of the sugarcane crop, or the sugarcane crop season of 1759 in the Leeward Islands. What these points highlight is the difficulty of actually um, getting the legislature's cooperation to actually uh, recruit the slaves in, in, in Antigua. The Antigua Assembly also recommended the recruitment of white volunteers. <laughs> well, for the service with Hobson, on terms he had proposed, including awards of conquered land to the volunteers and their officers. In other words, if they succeeded in capturing Guadeloupe, then the white volunteers would have access to some of the land that was captured in Guadeloupe. Uh, pleased by such positive responses from the assembly, Governor Thomas urged quick action, as the occasion is very pressing. This is urgent, urgency. 
including the appointment of commissioners or a committee of members from both houses of the legislature to view, appraise, and embark these auxiliary Negroes. But the council hesitated to support the assembly's proposal for recruiting white volunteers because they thought it would compromise the island's present or future safety to lessen or divide our small force, especially as so many of our white men are already engaged on board our private years, which is um, a, a number of private ships licensed by the government to attack the shipping of the enemy, okay? The Antigua census of 1756 listed 1,392 white men. While the Antigua Council argued against recruiting white volunteers, they eagerly supported raising the, raising the small core of slaves though they were not without apprehensions that, notice, they were not without apprehension or hesitant that the report which prevails here in Antigua of the desertion of some of the Barbados Negroes to the enemy in Guadeloupe for want of due allowance of provisions may be a great discouragement to the owners of Negroes unless an especial compulsive law be immediately passed to ascertain the number in an equitable proportion. These observations advising caution led the assembly to review Hobson's proposals, particularly his plan to compensate owners whose recruited slaves were killed or maimed, and to decide that it required a more full explication of Hobson's meaning or intention. The assembly therefore asked Governor Thomas to suggest to Hobson that he add to his proposal payment for slaves who may die or by any other means not return to their proper owners. Such an expanded or modified arrangement seemed more satisfactory. Additionally, the assembly supported granting land to land-hungry white Antigua volunteers in Guadeloupe, in Guadeloupe after its capture. Governor Thomas agreed to let Hobson know what was in the minds of his council and assembly but only after both of them reached an agreement about sending slaves to Guadalupe. That was very, very important. We have to recruit these slaves. Thomas went further to give his assurance that he would insist that the commanding officers at Guadalupe return the white volunteers to the various islands at the Crown's expense as soon as the expedition ended if they wished. As for the recruited slaves, they should be returned at no cost to their owners. There seems to be a kind of tug of war between the governor and his legislature trying to get these slaves um, recruited and sent over to help the British in this major campaign to capture Guadeloupe. So, recruiting slaves for reinforcing the British troops for Guadeloupe was not at all easy or without difficulty. Yet, as it turned out, the Antigua legislature could not agree on the content or details of the legislation then being drafted to recruit the slaves. The council rejected the assembly's drafted bill, but then advised Governor Thompson to issue a proclamation now, instead to encourage slave owners to volunteer 300 slaves and to appoint appraisers for them. You see, at first, the members of the legislature had and, and the governor had been talking about um, the possibility of um, passing a law to, to, to compel the owners of slaves to supply some slaves um, as recruits and so on. Now they're running into so much trouble and difficulty agreeing on anything that um, now the governor seems to agree with them that, okay, the easiest thing to do is to issue a proclamation asking slave owners to volunteer slaves and so forth. Now, this is going to be very interesting, this idea about volunteer. I mean, can you imagine slaves wanting to volunteer to go to war? Well, possibly, but um, this idea of volunteering gets very, very interesting. Around this time, in March 1759, Thomas received information that the French in the area were being reinforced. This obviously increased the threat to the Leeward Islands and drew the Marines from Guadeloupe to serve on board the men of war. These circumstances made the reinforcement of able Negroes for Guadeloupe very seasonable, very pressing, and the governor was quite pleased 
with the white volunteers who had come forward, with, who consisted principally of strangers who have served on board private jets and not of the natives or inhabitants of Antigua. Whatever the actual number of slaves and white volunteers that were finally recruited in the Leeward Islands, the Antigua Assembly noted that collectively, those from the island constituted a considerable body. A contingent of soldiers from the 38th Regiment of Foot stationed at Antigua also went over to Guadeloupe. Now, this is not very far away, as you can see on the map. The group of white men and adult male slaves who embarked at Antigua were all volunteers. White volunteers, black volunteers, but let me go on. Though it was most likely the slave owners who volunteered their slaves. So, <laughs> you understand this? Uh, it is difficult to say how many slaves may have pursued it persuaded their owners that they were willing to go on the mission to Guadeloupe. It can also be concluded on the evidence about the concerns of the Antigua legislature that at least in that colony, the slave-owning legislators, legislators paid very close attention to their material interests, though they were willing to support the campaign against Guadeloupe. On February 27, 1759, Major General, um, General Peregrine Hobson um, who, who led the British forces in Guadeloupe. He died at Guadeloupe when his health failed nearly one week after putting together the proposal he sent to Thomas for assisting, assistance with men, enslaved and free, and, and free. His second in command, Major General John Barrington, succeeded him. Commodore John Moore remained naval commander. Barrington writing to Secretary of State William Pitt on March 2, 1759, while the attack on Guadeloupe continued, drew attention to the challenges he faced, including sickness among the troops. Quote, there are many commissioned and non-commissioned officers now sick, Barrington said. And the remainder are falling down so fast. It is with the utmost difficulty that we are able to do the daily duty. In general, he said, the great number of sick among the troops here is a very melancholy consideration. Thus, Barrington found that he badly needed the men that Hobson had asked Thomas to send over from the Leeward Islands. That is to say, any number within 600 of the inhabitants and Negroes of, Barbe of Antigua. The legislature of Antigua had decided on 300 slaves as their quota for that colony, while the rest of the, uh, the Leeward Islands were left to make their own choices. Barrington told Pitt that this reinforcement will be the greatest service in carrying on the attack on the other side of Guadeloupe, which is to say at um, uh, Capiste, by going into the woods and mountains where the king's troops cannot act. And he proposed to make a similar appeal for a second time for assistance from Barbados. A few days later, in another letter to Pitt, March 6, 1759, Barrington reported he had, that he had heard from Thomas regarding difficulties in raising the reinforcement. Hobson had requested and that the modifications to that request now suggested by Governor Thomas would make a considerable addition to the expense of getting these men, but the necessity we have for them puts it out of my power to refuse the compliance. Barrington added that he had just written to Barbados for reinforcement about, of, of about 400 men. But Barbados did not send white men or even blacks. What the Barbados referred to send to help out Barrington was supplies, in, in, in including you know, food, um, chickens, uh, and, and other materials of that kind. Pitt strongly approved of the efforts made by Hobson Barrington to recruit reinforcements, including slaves, from Barbados and the Leeward Islands. If the slaves were not, if re, slave reinforcements were not forthcoming from Barbados, then you know it was imperative that they get these black reinforcements uh, from the Leeward Islands, which is so close by. Pitt instructed Barrington after Guadeloupe was under British, was at last under British control that you should, over and above the garrisons 
you shall judge necessary to place in the several forts and posts in your possession, retain as large a number of the said men from the islands as shall be possible. As such, light troops cannot fail to be of greatest utility, as well by strengthening the king's forces there as by bringing in fresh provisions. Pitt believed that such troops must also greatly tend to distress the enemy by making incursions into the country and breaking up and destroying the settlements, which operations they will, from being inured to the climate, be better fitted to carry on than the regular forces. Guadeloupe eventually fell to Barrington, but after a lot of difficulty. An articles of capitulation was signed on May 2, 1759. Adjacent French island colonies, including Marigaland, were also captured. Barrington, with good reason, boasted that in Guadeloupe he had secured to his majesty the most valuable conquest that has yet been made for some ages. He described the conquered French colony as about as big as Barbados, though thinly inhabited. The country, I am afraid, rather difficult as it is a good deal covered with wood and full of defiles. Guadeloupe was in fact not one con continuous island, but two, Grand Terre to the east, and Bastier to the west, separated by a narrow channel where the coastlines of the two almost converged. 18th century sources often refer to Bastier as Guadeloupe. It was this section of the two islands referred to together as Guadeloupe that Barrington was most likely referring to when he described the ruggedness of the terrain because Bastier and Grand Terre are quite different in physical features. Caribbean ended the British campaign for 1759 in the region. And in this campaign, the taking of Guadeloupe, obviously, the slaves recruited from the Leeward Islands played a major role, a major role, though mostly not as combat troops, but as manual workers, providing <laughs> the resources for the heavy lifting that came with that invasion, successful invasion. So we, we, we were pointing out that Barrington's conquest in, 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 in Wadloop, um ended the British campaign for 1759 in the Caribbean, during which the Leeward Islands patriotically, but also out of pure self-interest, provided calculated assistance, including provisions, armed men, slaves and whites, privateers and medical relief for the sick and wounded troops. <coughs> when Barrington returned to England in June 1759, the Antigua-born General Crump, an Antiguan-born General Crump, his second in command was made governor of Guadeloupe. Governor George Thomas of the Leeward Islands ended his term of office in 1766. He was made a baronet. So, Thomas, in other words. What happened to the slaves from the Leeward Islands who served the king in the conquest of Guadeloupe? That's a very important question. Further research in the records of the War Office in England's National Archives and in plantation records and other scattered sources may reveal answers to this question. How many of these enslaved recruits served again in 1762 in the British attacks on Martinique and Havana in Cuba? However, the, the records used in writing up what I have discussed tonight reveal a fairly clear picture of the valuable role played by the Leeward Islands in Britain's conquest of France's prized Caribbean possession of Guadeloupe in 1759. The players of the Leeward Islands who strode the stage of the unfolding drama included the governor, the island legislatures, the planters and other slave owners, the owners of seagoing vessels, and other mariners who became the crews of private chairs, the white volunteers of the islands, the detachment of the 30th Regiment of Foot of Regular Troops, and last but not least, the slaves who became recruits to provide mostly manpower and ranger service of the kind described by Richard Harding for an earlier period of operations in the Caribbean. In July 1759, the Pennsylvania Gazette reported news from Antigua that Quote, the detachment from the 38th Regiment and also the volunteers which went from hence to serve with the expedition of Guadeloupe, etc., 
arrived here from that island, everything being settled and regulated there, and those new conquests effectually secure. Merci. Thank you very much. Ça, moi, par les présenter devant nous, c'est un cahier ni un place important dans le livre là mon cas à toi mais à sous à toi moi c'est juste ça que créole c'est d'ici et et créole haïti pas même avec moi même mal levé moi pas de levé qui a parlé créole moi apprends ni à sous la oui ouais et invitation c'est comme ça moi apprends ni ma quoi papa moi et maman même te connaître nous te gaver ça le te ga bon cœur là parce si ou yo veut l'école pour éduquer ou ouais ou pas si poser ga parler cœur si vous êtes ga parler anglais c'est comme ça c'est décidé thank you very much for demonstration and you see thousands of people in the streets, you look through the crowd and then you'll see some horn players. <laughs> so uh, it's really become part of uh, the whole the whole society. You know?